And we're live. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, it looks like we are now uh, live on uh, YouTube. So uh, welcome, my name is uh, Paul Sugarman. Uh, this is the Instant Shakespeare Company, along with uh, Moliere Rendezvous. Uh, we are presenting a reading today of the School for Husbands. And so I will turn it over to our playmaster, Simone Coonrod. Uh, over to you, Simone. Great, welcome. Thank you, Paul. Welcome, everyone. Yes, School for Husbands by Moliere, translated by Charles Harren Wall. This comedy is, was premiered in Paris in 1661, meeting great success. And a year and a half later came its counterpart, the School for Wives. In between these two plays, Moliere married a prominent actress, Armand Berger, who was half his age. So we're gonna introduce the cast. We're gonna start with Tony. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. I am Tony Scheinman, and I am the voice of Molière, the reader des actes, and the magistrate. Drew. Hello, I'm Drew Bolander, and I'll be reading the role of Valère. Clinton. Hello, I'm Clinton Powell. I'm reading Ergast and a notary. Trudy. Hi there, I'm Trudy Bird, and I am very happy to be Lisette. Derek. Hi, I'm Derek Tarson. I'm playing a Reist. Angus. Angus Hepburn from London, reading Ganarelle. And Kate. Caitlin Mitchell, reading Leonore. Great. Okay. So, Moliere dedicated the School for Husbands to Monsieur. Duc de Orléans, the king's brother, in the following words. My lord, I hear show France things that are but little consistent. Nothing can be so great and superb as the name I place in front of this book, and nothing more mean than what it contains. Everyone will think this a strange mixture and some, to express its inequality, may say that it is like setting a crown of pearls and diamonds on an earthen statue, and making magnificent porticos and lofty triumphal arches to a mean cottage. But my lord, my excuse is that in this case I had no choice to make, and that the honor I have of belonging to your royal highness absolutely obliged me to dedicate to you the first work that I myself published. It is not a present I make you, it is a duty I discharge, and homages are never looked upon by the things they bring. I presumed, therefore, to dedicate a trifle to your royal highness, because I could not help it. But if I omit enlarging upon the glorious truths I might tell of you, it is through a just fear that those great that these great ideas would make my offering the more inconsiderable. I have imposed silence upon myself, meaning to wait for an opportunity better suited for introducing such fine things. All I intended in this epistle was to justify my actions to France and to have the glory of telling you yourself, my lord, with all possible submission that I am your Royal Highnesses, very humble, very obedient, and very faithful servant, Moliere. Thank you. 
talk less and let each of us live as he likes. Though you have the advantage of me in years and are old enough to be wise, yet I tell you that I mean to receive none of your reproof. But my fancy is the only counsellor I shall follow. And well, I'm quite satisfied with my way of living. But everyone condemns it. Yes, fools like yourself, brother. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasant compliment. I should like to know, since one ought to hear everything, what these fine critics blame in me. That surly and austere temper which shuns all the charms of society, gives a whimsical appearance to all your actions, and makes everything peculiar in you, even your dress. <laughs> I ought then to make myself a slave in fashion, and not to put on clothes for my own sake. <laughs> Would you not, my dear elder brother, for heaven be thanked, so you are, to tell you plainly by a matter of twenty years, and uh, that's not worth the trouble of mentioning, would you not, I say, by your precious nonsense, persuade me to adopt the fashion of those young sparks of yours? Oblige me to wear those little hats which provide ventilation for their weak brains and that flaxen hair, the vast curls whereof conceal the form of the human face those little doublets, but just below the arms, and his big collars falling down to the navel, those sleeves which one sees at treble, trying all the sorting, <laughs> and those petticoats called breeches, those tiny shoes covered with ribbons which make you look like a feather-legged pigeons, and those large rolls wherein the legs are put every morning, as it were, into the stocks, in which we see these gallants straddle about with their legs as wide apart as if they were the beams of a mill. <laughs> I should doubtless please you, but dizened in this way, I see that you wear the stupid gewgaws, which is the fashion to wear. We should always agree with the majority and never cause ourselves to be stared at. Extremes shock, and a wise man should do with his clothes as with his speech. Avoid too much affectation, and without being in too great a hurry, follow whatever change custom introduces. I do not think we should act like those people who always exaggerate the fashion, and who are annoyed that another should go farther than themselves in the extremes which they affect. But I maintain that it is wrong, for whatever reasons, obstinately to eschew what everyone observes. It would be better to be counted among the fools than to be the only wise person in opposition everyone else. <laughs> that smacks of the old man who, in order to impose upon the world, covers his grey hairs with a black wig. It is strange that you should be so careful always to fling my age in my face, ah. and that I should continually find you blaming my dress as well as my cheerfulness. One would imagine that old age ought to think of nothing but death, since it is condemned to give up all enjoyment and that it is not attended by enough ugliness of its own, but needs must needs be slovenly and crabbed. However that may be, I am resolved to stick to my way of dress. In spite of the fashion, I like my cap so that my head may be comfortably sheltered beneath it. A good long doublet, buttoned close, as it should be, which may keep the stomach warm and promote a healthy digestion. A pair of breeches made exactly to fit my thighs, shoes, like those of our wise ancestors, in which my feet may not be tortured. And he who does not like the look of me may shut his eyes. Leonore, Isabella, and Lisette enter. I take it all on myself, in case you are scolded. Always in one room, seeing no one. Such is his humor. I pity you, sister. Well for you, madam, that this brother, his brother is of quite another disposition. Fate was very kind in making you fall into the hands of a rational person. It is a wonder that he did not lock me up today or take me with him. I I would send him to the devil with his Spanish ruff and- Where are you going, if I may ask? We really do not know. I was urging my sister to take a walk and enjoy this pleasant and fine weather, but- uh... As for you, you may go wherever you please. You can run off. 
there are two of you together. But as for you, I forbid you, excuse me, to go out. Oh, brother, let them go amuse themselves. I am your servant, brother. Youth will... Youth is foolish, and old age, too, sometimes. Do you think there's any harm in her being with Leonor? Well, not so, but with me, I think she is still better. But... Again, her conduct must be guided by me. In short, I know the interest I ought to take in it. Have I less in her sisters? Oh, by heaven, each one argues and does as he likes. They are without relatives, and their father, our friend, entrusted them to us in his last hour, charging us both either to marry them, or if we decline, to dispose of them hereafter. He gave us, in writing, the full authority of a father and a husband over them from their infancy. Now, you undertook to bring up that one. I charged myself with the care of this one. You've gotten yours at your pleasure. Leave me, I pray, to manage the other as I think best. But well, it seems to me... It seems to me, and I say it openly, that this is the right way to speak on a, such a subject. You let your ward go about gaily and stylishly. I'm content. You let her have footmen and a maid. Oh, I agree. You let her gad about. Love, idleness, be freely courted by dandies. Oh, I am quite satisfied. But I intend that mine shall live according to my fancy and not according to her own that she shall be dressed in honest serge and wear only black on holidays. Then, shut up in the house, prudent in bearing, she shall apply herself entirely to domestic concerns. Mend my linen in her leisure hours, or else knit stockings for amusement. That she shall close her ears to the talk of young sparks and never go out without someone to watch her. In short, flesh is weak. I know what stories are going about. I have no mind to wear horns if I can help it. And as her lot requires her to marry me, I mean to be as certain of her as I am of myself. I believe you have no grounds for- Oh, hold your tongue. I shall teach you to go out without us. What, sir? Good heavens, madam, without wasting any more words, I'm not speaking to you for you're too clever. Do you regret to see Isabella with us? Yes. Since I must speak plainly, you spoil her for me. Your visit here only displeased me, and you will oblige me by honouring us no more. Do you wish that I shall likewise speak my thoughts plainly to you? I know not how she regards all this, but I know what effect mistrust would have on me. Though we are of the same father and mother, she is not much of my sister if your daily conduct produces any love in her. Indeed. All these precautions are disgraceful. Are we in Turkey that women must be shut up? There, they say, they are kept like slaves. This is why the Turks are cursed by God. Our honor, sir, is very weak indeed, if it must be perpetually watched. Do you think, after all, that these precautions are, are barred any of our designs, that when we take anything into our heads, the cleverest man would not be a, but a, a donkey to us. <sighs> all that vigilance of yours is but a fool's notion. The best way of all, I assure you, is to trust us. He who torments us puts himself in extreme peril, for our honor must ever be our, its own protection. To take so much trouble in preventing it is almost to give us a desire to sin. If I were suspected by my husband, I should have a very good mind to justify his fears. Oh, Ariste, this, my fine teacher, is your training. And you endure it without being troubled? Brother, her words should only make you smile. There is some reason in what she says. Their sex, their sex loves to enjoy a little freedom but they are, they are but ill-checked by so much austerity. Suspicious precautions, bolts and bars make neither wives nor maids virtuous. It is honor which must hold them to their duty, not the severity which we display towards them. To tell you candidly, a woman who is discreet by compulsion only is not often, by compulsion only is not often to be met with. We pretend in vain to, be, to govern all her actions. 
I find that it is the heart we must win. From my heart, heart, whatever care might be taken, I would scarcely trust my honor in the hands of one who, in the desires which might assail her, required nothing but an opportunity of falling. That's all nonsense. Have it so. But I, still, I maintain that we should instruct youth pleasantly, chide their faults with great tenderness, and not make them afraid of the name of virtue. Leonor's education has been based on these maxims. I have not made crimes of the smallest acts of liberty. I've always assented to her youthful wishes, and, thank heaven, I've never repented of it. I've allowed her to see good company, to go to amusements, balls, plays. These are things which, for my part, I think are calculated to form the minds of the young. The world is a school which, in my opinion, teaches them better how to live than any book. She liked to spend money on clothes, linens, ribbons. What then? I endeavored to gratify her wishes. These are pleasures which, when we are well off, we may permit to the girls of our family. Her father's command requires her to marry me, but it is not my intention to tyrannize over her. I'm quite aware that our years hardly suit, and I leave her complete liberty of choice. If a safe income of 4,000 crowns a year, great affection and consideration for her may, in her opinion, counterbalance and manage the inequality of our age, she may take me for her husband. If not, she may choose elsewhere. If she can be happier without me, I do not object. I prefer to see her with another husband rather than that her hand should be given me against her will. Oh, how sweet he is, all sugar and honey. Well, at all events, that is my disposition, and I thank heaven for it. I would never lay down these strict rules which make children wish their parents dead. But the liberty acquired in youth is not so easily withdrawn later on. All those feelings will please you, but little when you have to change her mode of life. And why change it? Why? Yes. I do not know. Is there anything in it that offends honor? Why, if you marry her, she may demand the same freedom which she enjoyed as a girl. Why not? And you so far agree with her as to let her have patches and ribbons? Doubtless. You're to let her gad about madly at every ball and public assembly? Yes, certainly. Uh, and the bowl will visit at your house. What then? We will junk it and give entertainments. With all my heart. Oh, and your wife is to listen to their fine speeches. Exactly. And you will look on these gallant visitors with a, a, a show of indifference. Of course. Oh, go on, you old idiot. Uh, Isabella, get indoors and hear no more of this shameful doctrine. Isabella exits into Scannerell's house. I mean to trust to the faithfulness of my wife and intend always to live as I have lived. Oh, how pleased I shall be to see him victimized. I cannot say what fate has in store for me, but as for you, I know that if you fail to be so, it is no fault of yours, for you are doing everything to bring it about. Oh, laugh on, Giggler. <laughs> what it is to see a railer of nearly sixty. I promise to preserve him against the fate you speak of. If he is to receive my, vow my vows at the altar... He may rest a cure, but I can tell you I would pass my word for nothing if I were your wife. We have a conscience for those who rely on us, but it is delightful, really, to cheat such folks as you. Hush, you cursed, ill-bred tongue. Brother, you drew these silly words on yourself. <sighs> Goodbye. Alter your temper and be warned that to shut up a wife is a bad plan. Your servant. I am not yours. Aristi, Lisette, and Leonor exit into Aristi's house, leaving Scannerel alone. Oh, they are well suited to one another. What an admirable family. A foolish old man with a worn out body who plays the fop, a girl mistress, and a thorough coquette. Impudent servants. No wisdom itself could not succeed, but would exhaust sense and reason trying to amend a household like this. By such associations, Isabella might lose those principles of honor which she learned amongst us. To prevent it, I shall presently send her back again to my cabbages and turkeys. Valer, his valet Ergast, 
enter without Scannerell seeing them. Ergast, that is he, the Argist whom I hate and stern guardian of whom, her whom I adore. In short, is there not something wonderful in the corruption of manners nowadays? I should like to address him if I get the chance and try to strike up an acquaintance with him. Well, instead of seeing that civility prevail with so admirably formed virtue in other days, uncontrolled and imperious youth hereabout assumes that Valer bows to Valer bows to Scannerel from a distance, but Scannerel does not notice. He does not see me bow to him. Perhaps his blind eye is on this side. Uh, let us cross to the right. Oh, I must go away from this place. Life in town only produces in me. I must go to get an introduction. Try to get some introduction. So, uh, I thought someone spoke in the country. Thank heaven, the fashionable follies do not offend my eyes. Speak to him. What is it? My ears tingle. He finally notices Valère bowing to him. Yeah, and all the recreations of our girls are about... Do you bow to me? Go up to him! Thither no coxcomb comes. What the deuce? Another? <laughs> what a great many bows. Sir, uh, my accosting disturbs you, I fear. Well, that may be. But yet the honor of your acquaintance is so great a happiness, so exquisite a pleasure that I had a great desire to pay my respects to you. Well? And to come to assure you without any deceit that I am wholly at your service. Well, I believe it. <laughs> I have the advantage of being one of your neighbors, for which I thank my lucky fate. No, that's all right. But, sir, do you know the news that is going around court and thought to be reliable? Well, what does it matter to me? True. <laughs> but we may sometimes be anxious to hear it. Shall you go and see the magnificent preparations for the birth of the Dauphin, sir? I think I feel inclined. Confess that Paris affords us a hundred delightful pleasures which are not to be found elsewhere. The provinces are a desert, a desert in comparison. How do you pass your time? On my own business. Oh, the mind demands relaxation and occasionally gives way by too close attention to serious occupations. What do you do in the evening before going to bed? What I please. <laughs> Doubtless no one could speak better. The answer is just, and it seems to be common sense to resolve never to do what does not please us. Mm. If I did not think you were too much occupied, I would drop in on you sometime after supper. Uh, your servant. And Scannerel enters his own house, leaving Valère and Ergast in the street. What do you think of that eccentric fool? His answers are abrupt in his reception is churlish. Oh, I'm in a rage. What for? Why am I in a rage? To see her I love in the power of a savage, a watchful dragon whose severity will not permit her to enjoy a single moment of liberty. That is just what is in your favor. Your love ought to expect a great deal from these circumstances. Know for your encouragement that a woman watched is half one and that the gloomy ill temper of husbands and fathers has always promoted the affairs of the gallant. Uh, I intrigue very little, for, for this is not one of my accomplishments. I do not pretend to be a gallant, <laughs> but I have served a score of such sportsmen who often used to tell me that it was their greatest delight to meet with churlish husbands who never come home without scolding, downright brutes, who, without rhyme or reason, criticize the conduct of their wives in everything, and proudly assuming the authority of a husband quarrel with them before the eyes of their admirers. One knows, they would say, how to take advantage of this, the lady's indignation at this kind of outrage on the one hand and the considerate compassion of the lover on the other, afford an opportunity for pushing matters far enough. <laughs> in a word, the surliness of Isabella's guardian is a circumstance sufficiently favorable for you. Oh, but I could never find one moment to speak to her in the four months I have ardently loved her. Love quickens people's wits, though it has little effect on yours. Uh, if I had been... Oh, why, what could you have done? 
for one never sees her without that brute in the house. There are neither maids nor men servants whom I might influence to assist me by the alluring temptation of some reward. Then she does not know yet. Then she does not yet know that you love her. It is a point on which I'm not informed. Wherever the churl took this fair one, she does. She always saw me like a shadow behind her. My looks daily try to explain to her the violence of my love. My eyes have spoken much, but who can tell whether after all their language could be understood? It is true that this language may sometimes prove obscure if it, if it have not writing or speech for its interpreter. What am I to do to rid myself of this vast difficulty and to learn whether the fair one has perceived that I love her? Tell me some means or other. That is what we have to discover. Let us go in for a while, the better to think over it. Valer and Ergast enter Valer's house, while almost immediately, Scannerel and Isabella ex enter the street from his house. That will do. Well, I know the house and the person simply from the description you have given me. Heaven be propitious and favor today the artful contrivance of an innocent love. You say they have told you his name is Valer? Yes. Yeah, well, that'll do. Don't make yourself uneasy about it. Go inside and leave me to act. I'm going at once to talk to this young madcap. For a girl, I'm planning a pretty bold scheme, but the unreasonable severity with which I am treated will be my excuse to every right mind. And Isabella re-enters Scannerel's house while Scannerel knocks very loudly at the door of Belair's house. Let us lose no time. Here it is. Who's there? Why, I'm dreaming. Hello, I say, hello, hello, somebody. Hello. Oh, I do not wonder after this information that he came up to me just now so meekly. But I must make haste and teach his foolish aspirant. Valer and Ergast and exit the house, Ergast almost running right into Scannerel. Oh, a plague on the lovely ox. Do you mean to knock me down, coming and sticking yourself in front of me like a post? Sir, I regret... Are you the man I want? I, sir? You. Your name is Valer, is it not? Yes. I am come to speak to you, if you will allow me. Oh, can I have the happiness to render you any service? No, but I propose to do you a good turn. That's what brings me to your house. To my house, sir? Well, to your house. Need you be so much astonished? I have good reason for it. I... I am delighted with the honor of your... Oh, don't mention the honor, I beseech you. The, the, will you not come in? Uh, there is no need. I pray you enter. No, I will go no further. As long as you stay here, I cannot listen to you. I will not budge. <laughs> well, I must yield. Quick, since this gentleman is resolved upon it, bring a chair. I am going to talk standing. Oh, as if I could permit such a thing. Oh. Intolerable delay. Such incivility would be quite unpardonable. Nothing can be so rude as to not listen to people who wish to speak to us. I obey then. You cannot do better. Mm? The two, Scannerel and Valer, make many compliments about putting on their hats. Look, it, 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 such ceremony is unnecessary. Will you listen to me? Uh, undoubtedly and most willingly. Tell me. Do you know that I am the guardian to a tolerably young and possibly handsome girl who lives in this neighborhood whose name is Isabella? Yes. As you know it, I need not tell it to you. But do you know likewise that as I find her charming, I care for her otherwise than as a guardian and that she is destined for the honor of being my wife? No! I tell it to you then. And also that it is well that your passion, if you please, should leave her in peace. Uh, who? Uh, I, sir? Yes, you. Let us have no more dissembling. Uh, who has told you that my heart is smitten by her? Those who are worthy of belief. Be more explicit. She herself. She? She. Is not that enough? Like a virtuous young girl who has loved me from childhood. She told me all just now. 
Moreover, she charged me to tell you that since she has everywhere been followed by you, her heart, which your pursuit greatly offends, has only too well understood the language of your eyes, and that your secret desires are well known to her, and that to try more fully to explain a passion which is contrary to the affection she entertains for me is to give yourself needless trouble. She, you say, of her own accord? Yes, makes yes, makes me come to you and give you this frank and plain message. Also, that having observed the violent love where with your soul is smitten, she would earlier have let you know what she thinks about you if, uh, perplexed as she was, she could have found anyone to send this message by. But at length, she was painfully compelled to make use of me in order to assure you, as I have told you, that her affection is denied to all, save me. That you have been ogling her long enough and that if you have ever so little brains, you will carry your passion somewhere else. Farewell till our next meeting. That's what I had to tell you. Ergast, what... What say you to such an adventure? See how he's taken aback. Uh, for my part, I think that there is nothing in it to displease you, that a rather subtle mystery is concealed under it. In short, that this message is not sent by one who desires to see the love and which she inspires in you. Well, he takes it as he ought. You think it a mystery? Yes. But he is looking at us. Let us get out of his sight. So Valer and Aragast re-enter the house very hastily. How his face showed his confusion. Now, doubtless he did not expect this message. Let me call Isabella. She is showing the, few, the fruits which education produces on the mind. Virtue is all she cares for, and her heart is so deeply steeped in it that she's offended if a man merely looks at her. Isabella enters from Scannerell's house. I fear that my love, full of his passion, has not understood my message rightly. Since I'm so strictly guarded, I must risk one which shall make my meaning clear. Here I am, returned again. Well? Oh, your words wrought their full purpose. I have done his business. He wanted to deny that his heart was touched. But when I told him I came from you, he stood immediately dumbfounded and confused. I don't believe you'll come here anymore. Oh, what do you tell me? I much feel the contrary, that he will still give us more trouble. Why do you fear this? You had hardly left the house when, going to the window to take a breath of air, I saw a young man at yonder turning, who first came most unexpectedly to wish me good morning and then threw right into my chamber a box enclosing a letter, sealed like a love letter. I meant at once to throw it after him, but after he'd already reached the end of the street, I felt very much annoyed by it. Oh, just see his trickery and rascality. It is my duty quickly to have this box and letter sent back to this detestable lover, that for that purpose I need someone, for I Dare not venture to ask yourself. Oh, on the contrary, darling. It shows me all the more your love and faithfulness. My heart joyfully accepts this task. You oblige me in this more than I can tell you. Take it then. Well, let us see what he has dared to say to you. Heavens, take care not to open it. Uh, why so? Will, will you make him think that it is I... A respectable girl ought always to refuse the letters a man sends her. The curiosity which she thus portrays shows a secret pleasure in listening to gallantries. I think it is right that this letter should be immediately returned to Valère unopened and that he may better learn this day the great contempt which my heart feels for him. So that this passions may not from this time lose all hope and never more attempt such a discretion. Oh, the truth, she's right in this. Well, your virtue charms me as well as your discretion. I see that my lessons have borne fruit in your mind and show yourself worthy of being my wife. Still, I do not like to stand in the way of your wishes. The letter is in your hands and you can open it. Oh, no, 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 far from it. Your reasons are too good. I go to acquit myself of the task you impose upon me. I have likewise to say a few words quite near, and then we'll return hither to set you address. Isabella retreats back into Scannerell's house. How did 
delighted I am to find her such a discreet girl. I have in my house a treasure of honor to consider a loving look treason, to receive a love letter as a supreme insult, and to have it carried back to the gallant by myself. <laughs> oh, I should like to know, seeing all this in my brother's ward would have acted thus on similar occasions. Upon my word, girls are what you make them. Hello? Hello? Ergast answers the door. Who's there? Uh, take this and tell your master not to presume so far as to write letters again and send them in gold boxes. Say also that Isabella is mighty offended at it. See, she's not even been opened. He will perceive what regard she has for his passion and what success he can expect in it. Scannerell enters his own house, leaving Ergast holding the box. Valère comes out and joins Ergast. What has that surly brute just given you? Uh, this letter, sir, as well as this box, which he pretends that Isabella has received from you and about which he says she is in a great rage. She returns it to you unopened. Read it quickly and let us see if I am mistaken. <clears throat> This letter will do no doubt surprise you. Both the resolution to write to you and the means of conveying it to your hands may be thought very bold in me, but I am in such a condition that I can no longer restrain myself. Well-founded repugnance to a marriage with which I am threatened in six days makes me risk everything. And in the determination to free myself from it by whatever means, I thought I had rather choose you than despair. Yet do not think that you owe all my evil fate. It is not the constraint in which I find myself that has given rise to the sentiments I entertain for you, but it hastens the avowal of them and makes me transgress the decorum which the proprieties of my sex require. It depends on you alone to make me shortly your own. I will only I will wait only until I have declared your intentions to you have declared your intentions to me before acquainting you with the resolution I have taken. But above all, remember it time remember that time presses and that two hearts which love each other ought to understand even the slightest hint. Well, <laughs> sir, is not this contrivance original for a young girl? She's not so very ignorant. <laughs> Would one have thought her capable of these love stratagems? Ah, oh, oh, I consider her altogether adorable. <laughs> this evidence of her wit and tenderness doubles my love for her and strengthens the feeling which her beauty inspires me. Oh, here comes the dupe. Uh, think what you will say to him. Scannerell enters, not seeing Valère and Ergast, and therefore Ooh. thinking himself alone. Oh, thrice and four times blessed be the law which forbids extravagant dress. No longer will the troubles of husbands be so great. Women will now be checked in their demands. Oh, how delighted I am with the king for this proclamation. How I wish for the peace of the same husbands that he would forbid coquetry, as well as lace and gold or silver embroidery. <laughs> I have bought the law on purpose so that Isabella may read it aloud, and by and by, when she is at leisure, it shall be our entertainment after supper. He sees Valère. Ah, well, Mr. Sandy here, would you like to send again love letters in boxes of gold? You doubtless thought you had found some young flirt, eager for an intrigue and melting before pretty speeches. You see how your presents are received? Believe me, you waste your powder and shot. Isabella is a discreet girl. She loves me, and your love insults her. Even someone else. Now be off. Yes, yes, your merits, to which everyone yields, are too great an obstacle, sir. Though my passion be sincere, it is folly to contend with you for the love of Isabella. Oh, it is really folly. Be sure I would have yielded to the fascination of her charms, could I have foreseen... I should not have yielded to the fascination of her charms, could I have foreseen that this wretched heart would find a rival so formidable as yourself. I believe it. Now I know better than to hope. I yield to you, sir, 
and that too without a murmur. Oh, you do well. Reason will have it so, for you shine with so many virtues that I should be wrong to regard with an angry eye the tender sentiments which Isabella entertains for you. Of course. Yes, yes, I yield to you, but at least I pray you, and it is the only favor, sir, begged by a wretched lover of whose pangs this day you are the sole cause. I pray you, I say, to assure Isabella that if my heart has been burning with love for her these three months, that passion is spotless and has never fostered a thought at which her honor could be offended. Ah. That relying solely on my heart's choice, my only design was to obtain her for my wife, if destiny had not opposed an obstacle to this pure flame in you who captivated her heart. Very good. That whatever happens, she must not think that her charms can be forgotten. That to whatever decrees of heaven I must submit, my fate is to love her to my last breath. And that if anything checks my pursuit, it is the just respect I have for your merits. Oh, that is wisely spoken. I shall go at once to repeat these words, which will not be disagreeable to her. But if you will listen to me, try to act so as to drive this passion from your mind. Farewell. An excellent dupe. Valer and Ergast retreat back inside Valer's house, leaving Scannerel alone. Oh, I feel a great pity for the poor wretch, so full of affection. <laughs> but it is unfortunate for him to have taken it into his head to try to storm a fortress which I have captured. Scannerel knocks at his own door, and Isabella answers. Never did lover display so much grief for a love letter returned unopened. At last he loses all hope and retires. But he earnestly entreated me to tell you that, at least in loving you, he never fostered a thought in which your honor could be offended, and that, relying solely on his heart's choice, his only desire was to obtain you for a wife. If destiny had not opposed an obstacle to his pure flame through me, who captivated your heart, that whatever happens, you must not think that your charms can ever be forgotten by him, that to whatever decrees of heaven he must submit, his fate is to love you till his last breath, and that if anything checks his pursuit, it is the just respect he has for my merits. Now, these are his very words, and far from blaming him, I think him a gentleman, and I pity him for loving you. His passion does not contradict my secret belief, and his looks have always assured me of his innocence. Uh, uh, what did you say? That is hard that you should so greatly pity a man that I hate like death, and oh. that if you loved me as much as you said, you would feel how he insults me at, by his addresses. Uh, but he did not know your inclinations. And from the uprightness of his intentions, his love does not deserve... It is, it is good intentions, I ask, to try and carry people off? Is it like a man of honor to form designs for marrying me by force and by cut taking me out of your hands? As if I were a girl to live after such a disgrace? How? Oh. Yes, yes. I have been informed that this base lover speaks of carrying me off by force. For my part, I cannot tell by what secret means he has learned so early that you intend to marry me in eight days at the latest, oh. since I was only told yesterday that you told me so. But they say that he intends to be beforehand with you and not let me unite my lot to yours. Oh, that's a bad case. Oh, pardon me, he is eminently a gentleman who only feels towards me. He is wrong, and this is past joking. Yes, your good nature encourages his folly. If you had spoken sharply to him just now, he would have feared your rage and my resentment. For even though he, since this letter was rejected, he mentioned this design which has shocked me. As I have been told, his love retains the belief that is well received by me, that I dread to marry you, whatever people may think, and should be rejoiced to see myself away from you. He's mad. Before you, he knows how to disguise. 
and his plan is to amuse you. Be sure that the wretch makes sport of you. <clears throat> By these fair speeches, I must confess that I am very unhappy. After all my pains to live honorably and to repel the addresses of a vile seducer, I must be exposed to his vexations and infamous designs against me. Oh, right, I think I fear nothing. For my part, I tell you that if you do not strongly reprove such an impudent attempt and do not find quickly means of ridding me of such bold persecutions, I will abandon all and not suffer any longer the insults which I receive from him. Oh, no, no, do not be so troubled, my little wife. Now, there, there, I'm going to find him and give him a good beating. Tell him, at least plainly, so that it may be in vain for him to gainsay it, that I have been told of his intentions upon good authority. That after this message, whatever he may undertake, I defy him to surprise me. And lastly, that without wasting any more sighs or time, he must know what my feelings are for you. That if he wishes not to be the cause of some mischief, he, must, he should not require to have the same thing told twice over. I will tell him what is right. But all this in such a way is to show him that I really speak seriously. <laughs> I will forget nothing, I assure you. I await your return impatiently. Pray, tell him, make as much haste as you can. I pine when I am a moment without seeing you. Oh, there my joy, my heart's delight. I will return immediately. Isabella enters Scannerell's house. Was there ever a girl more discreet and better behaved. Oh, 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 how happy I am. And what a pleasure it is to find a woman simply after my own heart. Yes, that's how our women ought to be and not like some I know, downright flirts who lower themselves to be courted and make their simple husbands to be pointed at all over Paris. <laughs> he knocks fiercely at Valère's door. Hello, oh, my enterprising, fine, gallant, Valer and Ergast enter. Sir, what brings you here again? Your follies. How? Well, you know well enough what I wish to speak to you about. To tell you plainly, I thought you had more sense. You've been making fun of me with your fine speeches and secretly nourish silly expectations. Look, you, I wish to treat you gently, but you will end up by making me very angry. Are you not ashamed? considering who you are to form such designs as you do, to intend to carry off a respectable girl, to interrupt a marriage on which our whole happiness depends. Uh, who told you this strange piece of news, sir? Now, let us not dissimulate. I have it from Isabella, who sends you word by me for the last time that she has plainly enough shown you what her choice is, that her heart entirely mine is insulted by such a plan that she would rather die than suffer such an outrage and that you will cause a terrible uproar unless you put an end to all this confusion if she really said uh, hmm. what i have just heard i confess my passion has nothing more to expect these expressions are plain enough to let me see that all is ended i must respect the judgment she has passed if did you doubt it then and fancy all the complaints that I have made to you on her behalf are mere pretenses. Do you wish that she herself should tell you her feelings? To set you right, I willingly consent to it. Follow me. You shall hear if I have added anything. And if a young heart hesitates between the two of you. They go to his house and Scannerell knocks at his own door. Isabella answers the door. You bring Valer to me? What is your design? Are you taking his part against me? Do you wish, charmed by his rare merits, to compel me to love him and conjure his visits? No, my love. Your affection is too dear to me for that, but he believes that my messages are untrue. He thinks that it is I who speak and cunningly represent you as full of hatred for him and of tenderness for me. I wish, therefore, from your own mouth, infallibly to cure him of a mistake which nourishes his love. What is not my soul completely bare to your eyes? And can you still doubt whom I love? Yes, all that this gentleman has told me on your behalf, madam, might well surprise a man. I confess I doubted it. 
This final sentence, which decides the fate of my great love, moves my feelings so much that it can be no offense if I wish to have it repeated. No, no, such a sentence should not surprise you. Scangarel told you my very sentiments. I consider them to be sufficiently founded on justice to make their full truth clear. Yes, I desire to be known and I ought to be believed that fate here represents two objects to my eyes who inspire me with different sentiments, agitate my heart. One by a choice, by a just choice in which my honor is involved has all my esteem and love and the other in return for his affection has all my anger and aversion. The presence of one is pleasing and dear to me and fills me with joy. But the sight of the other inspires me with secret emotions of hatred and horror. To see myself the wife of the one is all of my desire. And rather than belong to the other, I would lose my life. But I have sufficiently declared my real sentiments and languished too long under the severe torture. He whom I love must use diligence to make him who I hate lose all hope and deliver me by a happy marriage from a suffering more terrible than death. Yes, darling, I intend to gratify your wish. It is only to make me happy. You shall soon be so. I know it is a shame for a young woman so openly to declare her love. No, 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 no. But seeing what my lot is, such liberty must be allowed me. I can without blushing make so tender a confession to him whom I already regard as a husband. Oh, yes, my poor child, darling of my soul. Let him think then how to prove his passion to me. Yes, yes, here, kiss my hand. Let him... Without more sign, hasten a marriage, which is all I desire, and accept the insurance which I give him, never to listen to the vows of another. She pretends oh. to embrace Scannerell, but instead secretly gives Valère her hand to kiss. Oh, my little pretty face, my poor little darling, you shall not pine long, I promise you. There, you, say no more. You see, I do not make her speak. It is me alone she loves. Well, madam. Well, this is sufficient explanation. I learn by your words what you urge me to do. I shall soon know how to rid your presence of him who so greatly offends you. You cannot give me greater pleasure, for to be brief, the sight of him is intolerable. It is odious to me, and I detest it so much. Do I offend you by speaking thus? Do I? Oh, no, no, heavens, by no means. I do not say that, but in truth, uh, I pity his condition. You show your aversion too openly. I cannot show it too much on such an occasion. Oh, yes, you shall be satisfied. In three days, your eye shall no longer see the object, object which is odious to you. That is right. Farewell. I pity your misfortune. But... No, you will hear no complaint of me. The lady assuredly does us both justice, and I shall endeavor to satisfy her wishes. Farewell. <laughs> Poor fellow, his grief is excessive. Stay, embrace me. I am her second self. And Scannerel embraces Valère, and Valère and Ergast depart, pretending to be very downcast. Ah, I think he is greatly to be pitied. Not at all. For the rest, your love touches me to the quick, little darling, and I mean it shall have its reward. Eight days are too long for your impatience. Tomorrow I will marry you and will not invite... Tomorrow? You modestly pretend to shrink from it, but I well know the joy these words afford you. You but, wish it were already over. But... No, no, let us get everything ready for this marriage. Heaven inspire me with a plan I should pull off. Scannerel goes quickly into the house, leaving Isabella alone in the street. Yes, death seems to me a hundred times less dreadful than this faithful marriage into which I am forced. All that I am doing to escape its horror should excuse me in the eyes of those who blame me. Time presses, it is night, then let me fearlessly entrust my fate to a lover's fidelity. Scannerell re-enters, speaking backwards to those inside the house. 
Uh, here I am once more. Tomorrow they are going in my name. Oh, heaven! Oh, is it you, darling? Why are you going so late? You said when I left you that being rather tired, you would shut yourself up in your room. You even begged that on my return, I would let you be quiet till tomorrow morning. It, it is true, but... But what? You, you see, I'm confused. I do not know how to tell you the reason. Why, whatever can it be? A wonderful secret. It is my sister, who now compels me to go out, and who, for a purpose which, which I greatly blamed her, has borrowed my room in which I have shut her up. What? Could it be believed? She is in love with that suitor whom we have discarded. With Philaire? Desperately. Her passion is so great that I can compare it with nothing you may judge of its violence by her coming here alone at this hour to confide to me her love and to tell me positively that she will die if she does not obtain the object of her desire. That for more than a year, a secret intercourse has kept up the ardor of their love and that they have even pledged themselves to marry each other when their passion was new. Oh, a wretched girl. That being informed is the despair into which I have plunged the man whom she loves to see. She came to beg me to allow her to prevent a departure which would break her heart, to meet this lover tonight under my name in the street in which my room looks, where counterfeiting my voice, she may utter certain tender feelings and therefore tempt to stay, him to stay, in short, cleverly to secure for herself the regard that is known he has for me. And, and do you think that this will... will I, I, I'm enraged by it. What said I, sister? Are you mad? Do you not blush to indulge in such a love for one of those people who change every day? To forget your sex and betray the trust put in you by the man whom heaven has destined you to marry? Well, he deserves it richly. I'm delighted by it. Finally, my vexation employed a hundred arguments to reprove such baseness in her and enabled me to refuse her request for tonight. But she became so inopportune, shed so many tears, heaved so many sighs, and said so often that I was depriving her to despair if I refused to gratify her passion, that my heart was brought to consent in spite of me. And to justify this night's intrigue, to which affection for my own sister made me assent, I was about to bring Lucretia to sleep with me, whose virtues you extol to me daily. But you surprised me by your speedy return. Oh, no, 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 I will not have all this mystery at my house. As for my brother, I might agree to it, but they may be seen by someone in the street, and she whom I am to honour with my body must not only be modest and well-born, she must not even be suspected. Uh, let us send the miserable girl away, and, and let her... Ah, uh, you would me. overwhelm her with confusion, and she might not justify justly complain of my want of all discretion Ooh. since I must not countenance her design at least wait and do. send her away well, well do so but above all conceal yourself you want to I beg of you and the consent to see her depart without speaking one word to her okay. oh yes for your sake I will restrain my anger but as soon as she's gone, I will go and find my brother without delay. I shall be delighted to run and tell him of this business. Okay. I entreat you then not to mention my name. Good night, for I shall shut up myself in the same time. Till tomorrow, dear. And Isabella rushes back inside the house. How impatient I am to see her, my brother, and tell him of his plight. The good man has been victimized with all his bombast. I would not have this undone for 20 crowns. <laughs> Isabella's voice comes from inside the house. Yes, sister, I am sorry to incur your displeasure, but what you wish me to do is impossible. My honor, which is dear to me, would run too great a risk. Farewell, go home before it is too late. Oh, there she goes, fretting finally, I warrant. Let me lock the door for fear she should return. Isabella comes out of the house wearing a disguise. Heaven, abandon me not in my resolve. Whither can she be going? Night, who saveth me in my distress. To the gallant house. What is her design? Isabella knocks at Valer's door and he answers while Scanrel watches, hidden. 
Yes, yes, I will this night make an effort to speak to. Who is there? No noise, Valer. I have restored you. I am Isabella. You lie, Mix. It is not she. She is too staunch to those laws of honor which you forsake. You are falsely assuming her name and voice. But unless by the holy bonds of matrimony. Yes, yes, that is my only purpose. And here I make you a solemn promise that tomorrow I will go wherever you please to be married to you. <laughs> Poor deluded fool. <laughs> Enter with confidence. I now defy the power of your duped Argus. Before he can tear you from my love, this arm shall stab him to the heart a thousand times. And Valer and Isabella enter Valer's house, leaving Scannerel alone. Uh, oh, I can assure you I do not want to take from you a shameless girl so blinded by her passion. I am not jealous of your promise to her. If I am to believe, you shall be her husband. Yes, let us surprise him with this bold creature. The memory of her father, who was justly respected, and who, the great interest I take in her sister, demand that an attempt at least should be made to restore her honor. Hello there. He knocks at the door of a magistrate. The door opens, and a magistrate, a notary, and an attendant with a lantern enter. <laughs> what is it? Now, your servant, your worship, your presence in official garb is necessary here. Follow me, please with your lantern bearer. We were going. This is a very pressing business. What is it? To go into that house and surprise two persons who must be joined in lawful matrimony. It's a girl with whom I am connected and whom under promise of marriage, a certain Valer has seduced and got into his house. She comes of a noble and virtuous family, but at the same if time- the, If that is the business, it was well you met us since we have a notary here. Sir? Yes, a notary royal. And what is more, an honorable man. Oh, no need to add that. Come to this doorway, make no noise, but see that no one escapes. You should be fully, fully satisfied for your trouble, but be sure and do not let yourself be bribed. What? Do you think that an officer of justice will- no, 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 What I said was not meant in the reflection of your position. I will bring my brother here at once. Only let the lantern bearer accompany me. <laughs> the magistrate and the notary enter Valer's house while Scannerel knocks at Aristide's door and I'm Aristide going, enter, an, enter, I'm, answers. I'm going, to, I'm going to give this placable man a treat. Hello? Knocks. Hello? Why, what do you want, brother? Come, my fine teacher, my superannuated buck. I shall have something pretty to show you. How? I bring you good news. What is it? Uh, where is your Lenore, pray? Why this question? She is, as I think, at a friend's house at a ball. Eh? Oh, yes. Follow me. You shall see to what ball Missy has gone. What do you mean? Well, you've brought her up very well indeed. It's not good to be always finding fault. The mind is captivated by much tenderness. The suspicious precautions, bolt and bars, make neither wives nor maids virtuous. We cause them to do evil by so much austerity. Their sex demands a little freedom. Of a verity, she has taken her fill of it, the artful girl. And with her, virtue has grown very complacent. What is the drift of such a speech? Bravo, my elder brother. It is what you richly deserve. I would not for 20 pistoles that you should have missed this fruit of your silly maxims. Look at what our lessons have produced in these two sisters. One avoids the gallants, the other runs after them. If you will not make your riddle clearer. The riddle is that her ball is at Valère's. That I saw her go to him under cover of night and that she is at this moment in his arms. Who? Lenore. <laughs> a, a truce to jokes, I beg of you. I joke? <laughs> oh, he is excellent with his joking, poor fellow. I tell you, I tell you again that Valer has your Leor, Leonore in his house and that they have pledged each other before he dreamed of running after Isabel. 
This story is so very improbable. Oh, he will not believe it, even when he sees it. I'm getting angry upon my word. Old age is not good for much when brains are wanting. Oh. What? Brother, you mean... Do I mean nothing upon my soul. Only follow me. Your mind shall be satisfied directly. You shall see whether I am deceiving you and whether they have not pledged their troth for more than a year past. Is it likely she could have thus agreed to this engagement without telling me? Me, who in everything from her infancy ever displayed towards her a complete readiness to please and who a hundred times protested that it would never force her inclinations? <laughs> Your own eyes shall judge of the matter. I have already brought here a magistrate and a notary. We are concerned that the promised marriage shall at once restore to her the honor she has lost. But I don't suppose you are so mean-spirited as to wish, her to wish to marry her with this stain upon her, unless you have still some arguments to raise you above all kinds of ridicule. For my part, I shall never be so weak as wish to possess a heart in spite of itself, but... Ooh. After all, I cannot believe... What speeches you make! Come, this might go on forever. The magistrate and the notary enter from Valère's house. Sir, there is no need to use any compulsion here, gentlemen. If you wish to have them married, your anger may be appeased on the spot. Both are equally inclined to it. Valère has already given his hand, under his hand, a statement that he considers her who is now with him as his wife. The girl? He is within and will not come out unless you consent to gratify their desires. Valère appears at the window of his house. No, gentlemen, no man shall enter here until your pleasure be known to me. You know who I am. I have done my duty in signing the statement, which they can show you. If you intend to approve of the marriage, you must also put your names to this agreement. If not, prepare to take my life before you shall rob me of the object of my love. Oh, no! We have no notion of separating you from her. He has not yet been undeceived in the matter of Isabella. Let us make the most of his mistake. But is it Leonore? Hold your tongue. But... Be quiet. I want to know. Again, but you hold your tongue, I say. To be brief, whatever the consequence, Isabella has my solemn promise. I also have hers. If you consider everything, I am not so bad a match that you should blame her. What he says is not... Be quiet! I have a reason for it. You shall know the mystery. Uh, yes, without any more words, we both consent that you shall be the husband of her who is at present in your house. The contract is drawn up in those very terms, and there is a blank for the name, as we have not seen her. Sign, the lady can set you all at ease by and by. I agree to the arrangement. And so do I, with all my heart. Oh, we shall have a good laugh presently. There, brother, sign. You the honor, yours the honor to sign first. But why all this mystery? The deuce, with hesitation, sign, you simpleton. He talks of Isabella and you of Leonor. Are you not agreed, brother, if it be she to leave them to their mutual promises? Doubtless. You will sign then, I shall do the same. Oh, be it. I understand nothing of it. Oh, you shall be enlightened. We will soon return. The ah. magistrate and the notary exit back into Valère's house. Now then, I will give you a cue to this intrigue. Arist and Scannerel retire to the back of the stage, while Leonore and Lisette enter. Oh, what strange martyrdom! What bores all those young fools appear to me? I have stolen away from the ball on account of them. He tried to make himself agreeable to you. And I never endured anything more intolerable. I should prefer the simplest conversation to all the babblings of those say-nothings. They fancy everything. 
that must give way before their flaxen wigs and think they have said the cleverest witticism when they come up with their silly chaffing, chaffing tone and rally you stupidly about the love of an old man. For my part, I value more highly the affection of such an old man than all the giddy raptures of a youthful brain. But do I not see? Yes, so the matter stands. Ah, there she is, and her maid with her. Leonor, without being angry, I have reason to complain. You know whether I have ever sought to restrain you and whether I have not stated a hundred times that I left you full liberty to gratify your own wishes. Yet your heart, regardless of my approval, has pledged its faith as well as its love without my knowledge. I, I, I do not repent of my indulgence, but your conduct certainly annoys me. It is a way of acting which the tender friendship I have borne you does not merit. I know not why you speak to me thus, but believe me, I am as I have ever been. Nothing can alter my esteem for you. Love for any other man would seem to me a crime. If you will satisfy my wishes, a holy bond shall unite us tomorrow. On what foundation then have you, brother? I... What, what, did you not come out of Valera's house? Have you not been declaring your passion this very day? Have you not been for a year past in love with him? Who has been painting such pretty pictures of me? Who has been at the trouble of inventing such, such falsehoods? Isabella, Valere, the magistrate, the notary, and Ergast enter from inside Valere's house. Sister, I ask you generously to pardon me if by the freedom, by the freedom I have taken, I have brought some scandal upon your name. The urgent pressures of a great necessity suggested to me this disgraceful stratagem. Your example condemns such an escapade, but fortune treated us differently. As for you, sir, I will not excuse myself to you. I serve you much more than I wrong you. Heaven did not design for us to be with one another. As I found I was unworthy of your love and undeserving of a heart like of yours, I vastly preferred myself to see in another hands. For me, I esteem it my greatest glory and happiness to receive her, sir, from your hands. Brother, you must take this matter quietly. Your own conduct is the cause of this. I can see it is your unhappy lot that no one will pity you, though they know you have been made a fool of. Lord, I am glad of this. This reward of his mistrust is a striking retribution. I do not know whether the trick ought to be commended, but I am quite sure that I, at least, cannot blame it. His star condemns him to be a cuckold. It is lucky for him he is only a retrospective one. No, I cannot get the better of my astonishment. Faithlessness perplexes my understanding. I think that Satan in person could be no worse than such a jade. I, I could have sworn it was not in her. Unhappy he who trusts a woman after this. The best of them is always full of mischief. They were made to damn the whole world. Oh, I renounce the treacherous sex forever and give them to the devil with all my heart. Well said. Let us all go to my house. Come, Monsieur Valère. Tomorrow we will try to appease his wrath. And as for you, <laughs> if you know any churlish husbands, by all means, send them to school with us. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey everyone. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, I guess. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> You'd like to dance? <laughs> oh, why not? Why yeah. not? <laughs> I have two left feet, but I don't mind waving my only functioning arm around. <laughs> Nicely done, everyone. Did everyone have a good time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Good one. yeah. You can imagine when this was done with full movement uh, oh. and all the interaction between everybody, how hysterical it must have been. Yeah, in and out and of those it, houses. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Well, remember back in, it, a lot of the time, uh, there's one of the plays called The Flying Doctor. And it literally was a flying doctor because <laughs> they used mechanics a lot of the time. And the servant who's pretending to be a doctor in one scene and the servant in another, He's attached to a cable and he's hauled up to the second floor balcony when he's being the doctor and then dropped down again when he's being the servant. So they use machines quite a lot. Wow. That's fun. I love the phrase in the very beginning describing the sleeves eating, tasting. Oh, yeah, the, it's wonderful. Yes, yes. yes. The sauces. Right. It's lovely. Yeah. I mean, I I, when, I looked, when I went through the script, I mean, Charles Wall, it, it's very much a literal translation. Hmm. And you can see every so often it clunks a little bit and you can see how he's taking the French similes and the French metaphors and trying to make some sort of sense, but not converting them to English metaphors and similes, but trying to stick to the French. So occasionally they clunk, but some of the images are hysterical. Yeah. And I, I, I looked at trying to update it a bit, and then I realized, no, there's a, there's a rhythm and a style to the language that, that Wall wrote that it would be cruel to tamper with, because as long as you handle the dialogue right, it works. Mm -hmm. And I think all you guys showed that it does. Yeah. That was fun. Thank you, Simone. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you, uh, Simone. I know, it, and it's interesting. Um, it's interesting his his. I find it very interesting his use of school, um, oh, yeah. and that and that um, he's meaning to profess in, in in these in these plays, which imagine 17th century France oh, yeah. and the attitude toward women and wives, and you know he Moliere is just this bold, courageous soul who who writes these things. Absolutely. Um, and it gets even worse in the school for wives, which I'm working. I think I've got that one finished. Uh, and that uh, this one didn't get people too upset. Uh, it was telling men, you know, come on, guys, behave yourselves. This is not how you treat women. He gets a considerably worse in the school for wives, and that created huge arguments and fights and people complaining so much so that he then wrote. Um, the school for wives criticized, where it's actually women talking about it, uh, the play, and what you should take away from it, and how women should be treated, and how they should react. So he was, he was pretty much, a, you know, let's give women their rights and their dues. And he also, also followed up the school for wives with the Versailles impromptu, where he was basically showing that that was his company performing a play and they all caricatured themselves. And that was again showing, you know, the theater is a way of showing you what you should and shouldn't do. Uh, and if you're so hidebound that you're not going to take it, well, you know, too bad. I shall give up my soap. The message now. in the play. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Was there, was this, was, go on. No, no, carry on. Yeah, was, was there a sound going on in the middle of, of, of speaking? Paul was live at one point. Oh, okay, okay, that's what's going on. I couldn't tell, but I like, okay, just carry on, carry on. Every so often, I think he, he butt calls. 
<laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why that happened. I thought I was on mute the whole time. Sorry about yeah, that. So much but, a little uh, quick. Really good no job, problem. everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. It thanks, does, Paul. It does thanks, I think, show you why Moliere is worth looking at. Because he was very advanced for his time and fairly fearless in what he was doing. Um, I mean, he was embroiled in so many arguments and battles over performance rights and publication. And it's interesting that it notes because at the end of the play that this was the, the last time he had any character, well, himself particularly, actually talk to the audience. That the first of the, Scannerell is a recurring character in a whole lot of plays. Um, at least the name is anyway. Yeah, yeah. But again, it, it, he's, he's doing his selling point. Uh, oh. um, and the first, the Scannerell, the original play called Scannerell, was the first time he talked to the audience, and this was the last time. Thereafter, he didn't do it. I think we just missed the rain. It's just starting I, over here. Uh, ah. It's oh. been storming here for a while. It's, oh, it's, wow. been, it's been this like, like yeah. Noah's gathering the animals together. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like hail out here. Yeah. Oh, lovely. That means we get it in about 